It seems a long time ago that America was the undisputed world superpower, having defeated communism and with no other serious rivals on the world stage. But then came 9-11, the Iraq War, terrorism, and the Great Recession, and America's role is now less clear. Is the United States a declining superpower? Let's get into this debate with a couple of familiar faces for our viewers. Stein and Student, Janice Stein, founding director of the Monk School for Global Affairs at U of T, and Irvin Student, president of the Institute for 21st Century Questions and editor-in-chief and publisher of Global Brief magazine. Stein and Student, welcome back to TVO. Pleasure Thank to you. The next sentence I'm going to say would have sounded completely ridiculous a year ago, but here we go. If Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders is the next president of the United States of America, do you see an America, Janice, that is much less involved on the world stage? Well, I think uh, if it's Sanders, it's probably a better story, honestly, and we can come back to that. But if it's Donald Trump, I'm not sure that the United States will be less involved on the world stage. Uh, in fact, Trump has a very black and white view of the kind of involvement he would like when, you know, when there's any kind of pr problem, just pull out the Air Force, go get the job done and come back. So that does not speak for less involvement. It speaks for more muscular involvement on the world stage. President Trump, how does that sound? Let me think about it for a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> it's difficult. Um, of course, uh, I'm arguing here that, that if Trump becomes president, then, then uh, America's general decline will, will, will ex accelerate um, exponentially, a as it were. Uh, it's a difficult thing to accept, but let me, let me start by saying this. If I ask people or students or colleagues in uh, North America or Western Europe, particularly North America, who between Reagan and Gorbachev won the Cold War? And I think Janice is included in, in, in this company when they say, well, Reagan obviously won the Cold War. And I say, wrong, because much of the world is beginning to accept that Deng Xiaoping won the Cold War, mm. notwithstanding current uh, economic bottlenecks. This is a long-term return of China to the center of international affairs. Don't forget that Canada in 1867 was created after the Opium Wars had stripped China of its centrality, which it had enjoyed for many centuries. China is back. We haven't enjoyed such a world. So there's a general decline in uh, American centrality. The Americans accept that the Chinese know it. Second point is, if Trump becomes president, I have to think that there was a precursor to that. There was some sort of event that radicalized the United States to push Trump over the edge, uh, not just in, 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 in the Republican context, but uh, in, 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 a, in a bilateral race with, with the Democrats. What happened? There could be another ISIS attack, another terrorist attack, which means that America is going to be radicalized, America is going to be divided. Uh, this is, doesn't bode well for its general standing. Third point, uh, Trump doesn't understand the world, Janice's point. I'll stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got really two serious ones, and one I think that we're not going to debate whether Trump understands the world or not. I think it's pretty hard to argue that he does. Uh, the first point, that the Chinese have now re-emerged as a major power, absolutely right. And so if you say decline of the United States, Steve, yes, from a position when Europe was flat on its back and China was still in the throes of uh, uh, the early stages of a communist revolution in the late 40s. But can I understand sure. that? Is it an actual decline of American involvement, or is it more that the Chinese are just so much more I there? I think it's that the Chinese are so much more there. The United States has not withdrawn in any way, and it still remains to this day, uh, I think, that without the United States on board, nothing major gets done so if on it is, global issues. If it is President Trump then, a man who admits that he gets his foreign policy briefings off television programs. Fox News. Fox and Morning Joe and right. 60 Minutes. I mean, right. these are the people he quote. And, you know, I'm not, I don't want to disparage uh, other programs out by there by saying they have nothing good to contribute, but, but that is a strange place to get your foreign policy briefings it from. Is. So can you imagine a United States that is much more withdrawn from trying to push the levers of power around the world. Well, you know, it's interesting because we have a partial analogy, and, I, and again, it's only partial, but we had eight long years under President George Bush mm -hmm. from 2000 to 2008. What did we see? A global rise in anti-Americanism. And article after article, the declinists who wrote, this is the end of the United States, this is end of US influence. As soon as Bush leaves and Obama replaces him, 
the anti-Americanism goes down, uh, the critics in Europe disappear, uh, American leadership is back. You know, we have a prime minister in this country who's saying Canada is back. Well, the United States came back under President Obama. Now, it came back in ways uh, that some of the United States do not like, do not, not forcefully enough, not present enough, but the United States is back. The United States is still the greatest economy, the most innovative society, the most creative society, and anybody who bets against the United States Loses. And still the indispensable superpower the to indispensable. making progress on foreign affairs? Well, let, let me just say, I agree with Janice in, in, in the sense that we're both admirers of American civilization. It's just that I think Janice is spending a little bit too much time within American civilization to understand that much of the world is thinking differently. Uh, there is a good chunk of the world, given the chaos that's happened, not just under Bush, but including under Obama, where the Libyan intervention happened, and there were a lot of missed opportunities for diplomacy and, 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 and good judgment around the world, or indeed passivity. Look at Asia. The, the Asians would say in, uh, in Singapore and China, where is Obama? Where, where is he? We haven't seen anybody. Where is the pivot? Uh, so the first point is about uh, not just American assets, American judgment. There is, uh, since the Cold War, a general lament about uh, the withdrawal of American analytics, the withdrawal of linguists. Uh, although America attracts a lot of the world, it doesn't seem as curious about the, the real uh, happenings in much of the world. And it, as a result, uh, makes many, many mistakes. And those mistakes will be compounded to tragic effect under Donald Trump. So we know nature abhors a vacuum. So if the US, by retreating somewhat from a leadership position, is creating a part of a vacuum, hang on, wait for it, <laughs> Who fills that vacuum? Is it Russia? Is it China? Is it the EU? Irvin, who fills it? The answer is nobody knows yet. This is, this is, we are definitely at a turning point in history, uh, but only fools can say they can foretell uh, what's going to happen, uh, not only uh, 10 years from now, but two years from now. Who would have foreseen the Ukrainian revolution? Uh, who would have foreseen the end of the, of the Cold War? Except, by the way, some retrospective Russians today say, well, we foresaw that coming. Mm -hmm. uh, so nobody knows. Uh, the basic point is that the United States is a major power, it is not an indispensable power because a lot of global problems aren't being solved for lack of, of, of good judgment, for lack of assets, for lack of many competent players. See, I, I disagree um, almost every score. One, there is no question of American withdrawal in the world. Irvin talked about judgment. Judgment is different from presence. The United States is going to be present in the world in a major way no matter who becomes president. But not necessarily bringing good judgment to but bear. But that's a different issue, mm -hmm. right? But its presence is beyond doubt. Secondly, the United States does remain the indispensable power. If you look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was just put together, it was the United, without the United States, there would be no trade deal. Uh, the wisdom of that deal is open to question, especially if you're in Beijing. You are not very happy about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but it well, was... Because they're not in it. Because they were excluded from it. But, but it was orchestrated, and it is by the United States, and it's actually a deal, and that's why it really matters. Not about trade only, Steve. It's a deal about who will make the rules in trade for the next 30 to 40 years. Mm. That locks in, in a sense, American dominance. Syria, without the United States being involved and actively involved and engaged, no possible solution. It but doesn't even with matter. American with, involvement, nothing's happening. Well, there's now. some things that even superhumans cannot do, hmm. and there's always been true in world politics that even when the great powers can certainly come together, they can't solve some local problems. But if the United States isn't there, Nothing happens. That will not change. With, with the greatest respect for, for Janice, this reminds me of my grade eight uh, French immersion class when everyone defected from, from French immersion, uh, save uh, professor student, because they said, well, nobody speaks French anymore. Everyone's speaking English. Uh, Janice is speaking to the English speaking world, which falled under the TPP, Trans Pacific Partnership. And the Chinese Who's would in that say, world? well, the, tr the Chinese would say, what is the Trans Pacific Partnership? It's a response to our very rise. And the Americans would say, well, the Trans Pacific Partnership is important. It's a partial pivot to Asia. Why are we pivoting to Asia? We're pivoting to Asia because Asia is back, led by China. India is not in the same camp. Uh, and the most important uh, institution that's being created is not the TPP in the world. It is the Chinese-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a game changer, uh, to use our, our, our very Canadian parlance. The Chinese think long term. This is going to aggregate much more of the world than the uh, TPP. And the Americans will be in it before long. We in Canada should, of course, uh, be in it already. 
I am an admirer of American civilization. It's a major country. The world uh, will be much larger than American power. With Trump, American power will be in retreat. Could you imagine, Janice, I, I hesitate to call it a post-American world because there's probably no such thing, no, right? There is. But can we call it, what are we going to call it? It's going to be something different. Can you imagine a world where America leads on all issues around security, but for example, on things um, like climate change or other issues sure. that are non-security related, maybe other countries are going to take the lead. Yes, absolutely. So maybe we could call this a multipolar world with some division of labor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's entirely possible. The United States has not led on climate change. Um, even under President Obama, it's not a leader mm -hmm. on climate change because of Congress and the difficulty in getting through Congress. So certainly there are going to be big global issues in which the United States will I, and this is a, an interesting expression, we'll lead from behind uh, to quote Boy, President they, Obama. They get pilloried when they use they that expression. Fox for, News for hates that. that expression. Absolutely hates it. But on many of the most important global issues, were the United States to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which it easily could, um, that becomes a new global investment bank for infrastructure in which the Chinese and the United States work together. I, I, Let me add one yeah. other comment which is the United States is just as preeminent on economic issues. If you look at the so-called fourth industrial revolution, the Internet of Things, the opportunity to connect through smart technology, the United States is the undisputed mm -hmm. leader in the, what will be the economy of the future. We are making a, a no president, not even Donald Trump, can stop that. With, with the greatest <laughs> respect, I think uh, um, we're in, uh, great danger of American envy here as it, with, a, with, an, a, with an ahistorical tinge. That is to say, we haven't known a post-American world, but there's definitely a pre-American world, and the Chinese know it. As they see it, this is a, a return to normal. And I'm not here doing Chinese, China envy. All I say is if you speak to Chinese leaders and Chinese students today, uh, the mentality is quite different. It is, in my view, much more impressive than the American mentality today. It's hardworking. It corrects mistakes. It's thought long and hard about its vocation in the world. Their analytics on the world, frankly, are much better than American analytics. They've been much more humble. They've made fewer mistakes. So if you go, and I would commend all, all, our, all our, our viewers, and I certainly do to my friends and, and colleagues, go spend some time in Shanghai and Beijing. Look at, not just at the infrastructure. Look at, look at the thinking. Look at the debates that happen. Let me follow up on that. Let me follow it's up much on more that. impressive. If there's, if there's going to be a change in the, world, in the way the world organizes itself going forward, America leading a quote unquote NATO and or Western bloc. What are the other blocs that are going to develop over the next decade or two to sort of meet that challenge? Irvin, what do you, what do you see? I think there'll be, uh, apart from a China-led bloc, uh, large uh, swaths of chaos. Uh, which will begin to weigh in on, on the NATO bloc as well, which is why I think Canada, we should be much more promiscuous. We should watch the American uh, project with, with great interest. We're part of it. We should reach out to China. We should reach out to Russia. And we should make sure that the European Union stays together. We don't need to be under the general intellectual and spiritual aegis of the United States. I say this not as a nationalist, but just as a strategist. We should uh, lay our bets quite broadly. We don't know what the world is going to pretend, but China will be around in 100 years' time. The United States, probably, right? <laughs> Canada, uh, it's not sure. Russia definitely will, take a, will have a different form, but China will be around. Let me wager that. So let me put money on the fact that the United States will be around. And I'm not advocating that we be under uh, the U.S. thumb or that we be influenced exclusively by... Uh, American thought. And the United States is our neighbor to the South, and every prime minister since this country was founded has always given priority attention to the United States, and every prime minister, uh, for as long as I can foresee, will always have to do I that. I don't think he's, he's saying don't. It, but he's that saying that there are other it, eggs that we need to have in our basket of as well. Of course, but who says you can't walk and chew gum at the same time? We, you know, our prime minister, I suspect, will be going on a major mission to China. Uh, early this year in the spring. We, we have been engaged with China. We've had long and deep relationships uh, with Europeans and continue to do that. And in fact, we have relationships in Africa and in the Caribbean. So that's not an issue here. But to say that if we get a president of the United States, and many of us are 
watching in disbelief as election season, what I call the Wild West election season in the United States uh, unfolds. Uh, we're watching even if the, the person that we think is least credible and least qualified to hold that role, the United States suffers temporary damage, but it, it has so many assets and it is so capable of innovation, far more so than the Chinese economy. You're saying even a, cr so we, oh, even a crackpot yeah, as, as president the, can't ruin it. Absolutely not. And okay. the Chinese, if you look, you know, and I, I've been to Beijing many times and Shanghai, and we have great partners, university partners there. Those partners are suffering terribly right now in China because the room for dissent is diminishing. The room for independent thinking is diminishing. You don't flourish in the fourth industrial revolution if there's no room for independent thinking for creativity. Irvin. I'm, I'm unimpressed, which is to say that um, Ch Janice, of course, quotes that every Canadian prime minister has been close to the United States, without a doubt. Paying I mean, attention and, to. And, 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 and we should. We shouldn't, however, keep quoting American ambassadors, American secretaries of state. Uh, we should have our own mind. However, uh, the point is, is, is that we should have historical longitude. China was big before Canada was around. It's back. Uh, if you go to China today, uh, one, one of two, there, there'll be two main points to take away. One is that they are no longer deferential to Western thinking. That is, they, they say, well, we have a lot to offer, and did we can do better. Mm. Who will be, build high-speed rail in, in North America when it finally arrives? And it'll probably arrive in Mexico before it does in Canada and the United States. Mm. The Chinese. They mm. used to come as the lay laborers who build the Trans-Pacific Railway in Canada. Today, they come as the architects, first point. The second point is about judgment. The Chinese will say, if you look at a ledger since the end of the Cold War, which is why I say Deng Xiaoping won the Cold War, they say, who's caused more damage internationally in terms of uh, military extroversion, adventures, and bad judgment? We, unfortunately, in the West. Canada hasn't been party to all of that, but the United States has been extremely adventurous and has more blood on its hands. That's where I want to finish up. Does Canada have a role to play looking forward if there is a president of the United States whom we don't necessarily have the most confidence in. I'm not naming names, but there's, you know, could be one in each party, you never know. Uh, does Canada have a role to play in restraining America's adventurism on the world stage? So, in, yes, um, and there's a long history of Canada doing that as well. But what does that take, Steve? And I can only imagine how difficult this will be. It actually takes a good personal relationship between our prime minister and their president. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that's challenging um, under some of the scenarios that are unfolding in the United States. That's important. Secondly, we also are very useful at interpreting what's going on uh, in the United States, which others regard with utter disbelief. Uh, we've been very effective in the past in doing that with our European friends. I can imagine we will do it with our Asian friends mm. as well. So even under the worst circumstances, because China may say this is our century, the American century is over, uh, I don't think the Chinese are right about that, but which, whatever happens, China pays an inordinate amount of attention to the United States, has more institutes that study the United States than we do in Canada. What, that tells you something. What do you think Justin Trudeau's job will be if it's President Trump or President Sanders? Uh, if, in, in both cases, I think uh, the first job will be to have a, a sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> in respect of Trump in particular, uh, even when Putin, you know, the Russians for all their complexities are not bereft of a sense of humor. Uh, so when Putin compliments Trump, he does so tongue in cheek. Uh, and everyone uh, who understands Russian uh, understands that. But the key point is to have a sense of humor, uh, to have levity. In, in both cases, but particularly in Trump, I would say uh, look at our immigration levels. Uh, the people who founded much of this country were loyalists, they were Americans, they did a great job. Uh, Canada should be, in my view, much more adventurous and much more ambitious in attracting uh, disaffected Americans. That's the best thing we can do. <laughs> in terms of the, the relationship, of course a personal relationship will help, uh, but I think uh, hard assets from other foes and the general conjuncture in the world will apply much greater pressure. Okay, friends, that's our time. Janice Stein, Irvin Student, thanks so much. You're thanks welcome so much. as we say goodnight on the edge of the American century. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.